Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Personalization Outbreak Podcast, your go-to podcast for meaningful conversations with influential leaders from different sectors every week. Our guest today, Annabelle Fall, is the Group Head of People Innovation and Transformation at Zurich Insurance Company. Annabelle's distinct approach to the human resources function was influenced by her work as a strategy consultant and leader in corporate social responsibility and sustainability. Now, together, we'll talk about the notion of psychological safety and why organizations are struggling to achieve workplace sustainability and trying to avoid the systems that have historically suppressed employees' individuality. We will also discuss the changing dynamics of the human resources department and why we should begin to approach HR as a business responsibility. So we, before we get started, please click the like button below, share it with your colleagues, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and social media at Glenn Yopis so that you can be in touch with our most recent content about leadership in the age of personalization. Let's get started. You are listening to Personalization Outbreak, a podcast about the collapse of traditional corporate standards in today's more personalized world. I'm Glenn Yopis. I'm a leadership strategist, author, contributor to Forbes, and founder of the Leadership in the Age of Personalization movement. On this show, I'm interviewing executives across multiple sectors to find out how the balance between standardization and personalization can exist. Welcome to the show, Annabelle, and thanks for being with us. Thank you, Glenn, for having me. Very excited to be here. Well, thank you. We're we're very grateful that you're with us. So, Annabelle, let's get to know you as an individual. I mean, in the age of personalization, it's all about seeing and knowing uh, the individual. So um, explain to us why you, or not why, but when you feel psychological safety. I mean, when do you feel this? In fact, perhaps you could explain why you feel it when you experience it. It's a very interesting question. I think psychological safety is so important these days and ever more topic, luckily. So I think we need to think about the full individual and, and how to feel safe. I, I normally say when I'm with friends and family, and that's when I feel safe because you feel respected, you feel loved, you, you feel when people give you negative feedback, it's in the sense of helping you. And I think so whenever I feel safe, it's in an environment where I feel I can be my full self. And that people actually care about me as an individual rather than just about uh, what I bring to the table. And when that happens, it's the perfect magic potion where you can get feedback and uh, accept that feedback because we all have our own flaws, as as we know. And uh, I think also with age, my I've managed to feel safer because I care less about what other people think. Uh, it's funny because I was asked by a psychiatrist the other day, how, how, how do you feel, uh, which age would you like to be? And most people say sort of in their 20s and 30s. And I said, I don't want to go back to that time. I, I actually really enjoy now that I found my own full self, if that makes sense. Makes perfect sense. In fact, okay, so you've triggered a couple of thoughts. Number one, why do you think most employees don't feel that psychological safety at work? I think it comes from the fact that Organizations are often not congruent. There's politics or felt politics. People are told how to behave rather than how to be. So so a lot of trainings talk to you about this is what you have to do. This is what you have to do. This is instead of talking about what lies behind it. And and I think sometimes it's very hard to be that person and you've had your own experiences, the baggage that you bring along. And also many leaders have been led by people who might not have accepted that personal characteristics who looked more for people that were doing tasks rather than bringing impact. And and I think that creates this sense of having to be someone one is not always. And uh, we always say you have to bring your full self, you have to be authentic. But sometimes people say, what happens if I'm really my full self? Would you really want to see that? And I think people are struggling with that uh, dichotomy in a a sense. Well, uh, and understandably so. I mean, most leaders uh, Truthfully, they're not really even qualified to lead anymore because not only are they responsible for beyond performance and uh, but with respect to people, they're responsible for not only the 
the psychological safety of an individual based upon what's going on in their personal life, but also what's happening uh, with business performance. And so what do you tell a leader that isn't quite ready to assume that broader responsibility of leadership? So I think we need to be very careful whom we make leaders. And I think one part of the work that I do is also thinking about, does everyone have to be a leader to progress? Can you not become a senior person within an organization without leading people? Because that is a responsibility and, and even a task that not everyone wants. And if you look at agile organizations, many of them actually separate the people leadership from the management of pro projects and content. So that I think is already an interesting part. And then I think you can only be a leader if, if you're willing to question yourself and be have humility that you don't know all the answers because none of us do. Yeah. And, and I think the problem is the world has become so complicated. Information is so complicated. Careers are no longer uh, sort of typical and, and having a normal flow. So you need to, if you think you need to have the answers, you've lost already. I think you need to ask the right questions and learn to ask questions rather than feeling you need to give the answers. So let's go deeper in that. What how do we get leaders, employees, but let's talk about leaders learning how to ask the right questions. Because, you know, as you noted, I mean, uh, business has always been in search of the right answers, but not necessarily the right question. Oh, that's the tough question. Uh, if it was that easy, it would be uh, probably easier to do. I, I think the first thing is to just listen to what the person says and then react to what the person has said. That's the best way of having a real, the right question, because the people that you talk to often give you the clues of where you need to go. And I, I find it always fascinating when people talk about difficult conversations. I'm like, why is a conversation difficult? Right. It's only difficult if you consider something. You, you don't like what you have to say, but if you consider most conversations should be organic and they're not. And so the right question comes when you are listening fully. So why is it that this notion of listening is becoming such a hot topic now? I mean, shouldn't we have been doing that all along? I mean, uh, there's this listening uh, revolution now. What is it that we need to learn differently about how to listen better, in your opinion, Angela? I actually don't know if we never listened or whether it's something that we've lost with our uh, attention span and too much information, because I think in the past, you were in the moment when you were somewhere. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you go to a restaurant. Most people have their mobile phones next to them on their table or talk to They talk, but our attention span is quite short. I even notice it now that we're all with COVID times on, on the computers. It's so easy to lose track. So, so I think that's one thing. We don't have any more this full attention. And I think that was different in the past. And therefore, it's become something that became a problem that wasn't necessarily the same problem before. And then on top of it, the world has become more complex. Before that, you needed to listen, but you had a clue and you could put one and one together and you had the answer. Hmm. Whereas now, one and one doesn't give you the answer. You know, Annabelle, I know I'm throwing some pretty tough ones at you, uh, but you're good. And I, I, I think that this, um, this idea that we're just not present is become more and more clear. And let's face it, you enjoy solving for disruption. And I'm going to ask you why in a moment. But, uh, but with the age of personalization, it's clear that the individual is now influencing uh, what their expectations are from their employer, their they're influencing the ways we learn, the ways we work, you know, the ways we conduct business. Uh, how do we need to disrupt? Well, let's first ask, I want to ask you, why do you enjoy uh, solving for disruption so much? But as a part two to that question, what do we need to do to disrupt this function of human resources and in uh, how we approach uh, the importance of people uh, moving forward. Well, you, you said the first ones were tougher. It's getting tougher and tougher, I must say. No, on a, on a serious note, I think disruption is not for disruption's sake. I think, however, we need to question ourselves on the status quo and what functions and what doesn't and not shy away from change. And most people are scared of change. 
it's 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 in the nature of the human being you 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 know something you want to continue and i find it the the more interesting part lies where you push yourself to boundaries it's the place where you learn it's the place where uh, innovation happens it's the place where where you can cross borders in a, if that makes sense and and that's why i like disruption so having someone like me just do I use the image of a light switch. So you can either be the person that keeps the light on, which is extremely important and many organizations need that, or you can be the one that designs the light switch. And I, I get more energy from the second one. It's also probably where I'm better at. Let's be honest, we all have strengths and weaknesses. So, But what I, what I like about disruption is it helps us to, getting out of your comfort zone get, helps us to get to the next level. And that's why I like it. But you have to always be careful and why I don't think disruptions always work or change always works is that we try to go too far too quickly and one of the new trends i might call it the trend of agility and agile projects i i'm always a bit nervous because people often use agile for chaos but if you truly look at the nature of agile work the idea is you dare to go in with something and you course correct and you course correct and you course correct and you learn on along the journey instead of trying to paint the full picture and then design it and then go there. Whereas I think disruption has to be in elements that the organization can take, which is a key element for managing change, but also to, to, to learn because the world is changing. What, what I designed today for in two years time, two years time, I've known that the world looks different. So it might be outdated by the time we get there. However, if you go in increments, Two but, years, maybe six months. Yeah, no, I am sorry. No, but a large scale transformations normally take two years. So you have to, exactly as you say, you have to put it in bite sizes to make it work and to learn along the way. No, I'm, before you go into you know, what needs to be disrupted uh, with human resources, you, you made me realize a couple of things. One is, why weren't we always agile and why didn't we always welcome it? And what I've learned is that, um, and again, I'd like to get your perspective on this. Are we really saying that historically we've been playing to lose, playing not to lose rather than playing to win? I, I think in the human nature, change is scary. And I don't think it is that we play to not to lose versus play to win. I think it was just. There, there were a few innovators that really drove the change, but work was much more uh, manual or you, you had repetitive tasks which are getting less and less and if you look forward a few months but certainly a few years more and more gets replaced by ai etc which is a repetitive task and therefore you need to really be willing to to go different and bring to work the full humanity that you have at play so i don't think it's it was a not wanting to take risks but maybe it was a little bit of that but also complacency of, of the, and, and I see that in many colleagues today, it's not about past and future. So I don't, I, I'm having a hard time to answer that question, to be quite no, honest. Well, 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 first of all, it's a tough one. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not, in, I'm not uh, trying to say that that's what people's intentions were, but I think what we're learning coming, you know, slowly coming out of this pandemic, that maybe we were playing not to lose unknowingly. Uh, because now we yeah. recognize that there's so much time that we that we've wasted solving for many of the right things that you know all of a sudden agility seems to be this skill that we need when we should have had it all along. And I guess the point that I'm making is this is the da dangers of standardization because standardization limits individual contribution, it limits creativity, it limits how far an individual can go because we have to stay on track with what the protocols say. And, and now being agile really is another way of giving people freedom uh, to navigate what's in the best interest of the organization. Did you have a comment on that? Leaders are scared of that. And it's funny when you looked at one and a half years ago at the beginning of uh, our homework, et cetera, I remember one, a little bit before that, we were talking about, oh, should we give more flexibility? No, but I'd like to see my team. I don't, there was a lack of trust potentially that work would get done. And how would you ever work remotely in large scale? And suddenly we're there and it, and it, and it works. So uh, that's one thing. The, the other topic around 
personalization that you mentioned is I'm trying to 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 formulate it because I think there is something around the fact that people are so much more different combinations and the work has changed but at the same time leaders are not wanting to let go many leaders think they need to control and this need to control creates an, an automatic way of no longer looking at another person as an individual that brings something but actually as someone who needs to do a task and part of the work we're doing at the moment is to think about what is a job and how do we move away from a a job that has tasks versus a job that explains the nature of work and the impact you're looking for from someone. That's power. I mean, keep going. I mean, this is really important because, you know, this goes back to uh, in, in, in a small way, but it, it aligns that, you know, people always feel that they have to believe in the mission rather than feeling that they can contribute to what the mission should really be. And, you know, people want that sense of, purpose and individual contribution. They, they want to know how they're influencing and impacting. And, and uh, so how do we, uh, in, the, in the work that you do in, in people, uh, innovation and transformation, how, how do we create the systems and or the conditions to allow for that impact? And I think one is to take away as much rules and move towards principles. Principles are always better than rules. And uh, on top of it, there's something around maybe bringing in the systems to have the right conversations, but not thinking that the system solves the problem. That's often the issue. The system is not the solution. It's just a supporter of the right conversations. And then there is something around building in leaders the sense of psychologically safety to come back to the beginning. Because if I feel safe that my team, if they make mistakes, I'm not crucified. Uh, crucified for it, but I, uh, we all celebrate both the learnings from failures and the successes because both are equally important. Then I think we're creating that sense where people feel safer to be leaders that let go and employees that bring their full value to the table. And I guess from my previous uh, career, when I was a management consultant, it was all around the obligation to dissent, having an opinion, sharing that opinion, not going by a hierarchy because Everyone, we're talking about diverse teams and diversity matters, but it only matters and it only brings value if everyone brings their different perspective to the table. If we all just do what we are told to do, we don't bring that diversity and we get zero value from diversity, I would say. First of all, I'm going to get to that one in a moment. Um, I'm really enjoying this. And I love what you said, and I've never heard it this way. For years, though it's been, I guess, a top of mind in the last few years. This notion of psychological safety, kind of how we started the conversation, it's how the employee finds it. But given the demands of the employee to their employer and their leader, now it's whether the leader has the psychological safety to actually lead. Yeah. That's the conclusion Absolutely. that you just basically created, is that you can't let a leader can't let go unless they have psychological safety. So given that most of them don't have that psychological safety, they can't lead. At any rate, fascinating. And um, so let's talk a little bit about the disruption of the human resources department. What has to change here? I mean, this is a, a department that, let's face it, it's been very compliance driven. It's there to protect the organization. Uh, actually, I personally believe it's been there to protect the organization more than the people. But now we're seeing that this has to flip. Now we need to think about the individual first. How do we change the dynamics of a human resources department, uh, given that you know now we really have to put the individual at the center? So it's, uh, I, I, I wouldn't have gone in human resources probably 20 years ago when it was more of a compliance function. Obviously, there were always exceptions. So don't get me wrong. There was been organizations that sure. led uh, through, through that and leaders who, who really saw the value of talent and, and the importance of bringing the right people to the table and only delivering through the people that you have, because that's really what an organization is. It's, it's a few resources and people. And I hate the word human resource because it brings makes people equal to other resources. But anyway, which is probably the entire notion of 
already in the title, we talk about compliance, HR compliance. It's a resource you manage. It's not a human being. But I do think there, there is the need to change and there's an openness to change, not equally in all organizations. Uh, but I think there's a sense that talent is becoming more important. People are becoming more demanding. It's no longer just about having a salary and uh, nine to five doesn't exist anymore. It's much more going into each other and flowing into each other. So I think there, there, there's there been the sense that we need to do something different to, to be an organization. And the word of culture and organizational culture is becoming more and more important. And it becomes human resource that's meant to drive that. My issue is human resource is only as good as the people that are in the organization and the willingness to listen, coming back to listening. But uh, the importance that if the HR or the people function doesn't have a seat on the table, it cannot highlight the concerns and the risks and, and be there to find the compromises. Because often people priorities are not always aligned with the business priorities. And, and you need to make trade-offs. You just need to make the right ones and, and not always make it in one-sided. So given that you come from a, a you know, management stra you know, strategy consultant uh, perspective and in, in corporate social responsibility and sustainability, what do you think are the critical competencies for the, 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 the people officer um, in today's organization? A people officer has actually probably even more has to have a brighter width, width of of, of uh, focus areas because you need to understand the business. I mean, let's let's face it. I mean, in the end, it's not a compliance, but if you don't understand the business, you don't bring in the right people. You need to understand the culture you want to have because everything you do will support that culture or detract it. So, how you do compensation if you want a competitive environment and you you do a large variation in assessments and bonuses if you want a team approach you don't if you are a startup you probably wouldn't spend too much time on performance management because or performance assessment you'd rather manage the great performers uh higher and and the low performers out but but you wouldn't have a full system because it doesn't make sense so you need to find the the right balance in that and uh and i think that is extremely difficult to find. And I think in human resource, we need to feel ourselves not as managers of capacity, but as, as guides of the organization and the different leaders, because honestly, hardly anything should be driven by HR, but mostly by the business. And, and that brings me to your question around how do you drive change in an organization? If you drive change from one function, change won't happen. You need to, to bring it, make it personal and make it personal for the different needs of different people. So how do how do how should organizations be thinking now, uh, especially uh, in the boardroom about uh, the the people function? I mean, clearly it's changing, and the demands for change are there. Uh, so how do, in other words, how do we get uh, the voice of the the people officer at the table, uh, not to be the last to be heard, but maybe the first? So, so it's funny because I, I find it interesting that organizations already set a symbol how important people are for them by the organizational structure. So I've seen many organizations where HR is not considered uh, in the exco or part of the table. They are guests in the exco, and I think that in itself is a problem. And uh, because if you're a guest, you behave differently than if you're a peer. It's, it's, you, you feel a different psychological safety, I guess. You are in the room, but also meant to be in the room and not as a guest. Very different. And, and so I think I've seen organizations that uh, have that, where the people officer is, is key to, to the, the, the leading of the organization, and therefore have the same right to say whenever they want to, not be the last person. And you have organizations where they are guests, and I think you can see it in the way certain things are driven and the nervousness of of the function and trying to comply. I have seen so many HR leaders who see their role in pleasing the business. And um, I always say my role is not to please my boss or anyone else. My role is to help them and say the right things that they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And I think that is, you, you need that awareness. And that's not in HR, that's everywhere. We need to say what needs to be said, not what other people want to hear. So otherwise we're not bringing value. Do, do you think that, um the function of 
people should, um, well, let me put this differently. The accountability around uh, the people role, the HR role, should only reside in HR. I mean, don't you think that every business unit leader should be responsible for HR in, in, in a sense? That's why I said for me, HR is, is not, they don't drive the, they should drive the right conversation, support leaders, give feedback, drive people to see different perspectives, provide uh, the space for conversations. But honestly, I, when I did the, first, the last uh, change program, I actually on purpose never made it an HR project. I made it a business and, and it, I asked other people to lead uh, and lead the conversation, to lead the content. And that mm. actually worked really, really well because HR is seen, and I, I find that quite sad, but the perception of HR is a bit what you've asked in your question. Uh, it's a bit an old fashioned, uh, much compliance, just the people, and probably the people who always say no, whether you can pay more or this, or they bring rules. It's not an inspiring function. And I, I do hope that that changes if, if suddenly when we're, we're not seeing ourselves as, as naysayer, but actually rather the, okay, let me understand your problem. And let me now tell you how, or talk to you, how can we solve it while still doing the right thing? Because often the first solution of different people is not the right one. So HR is not, so the people experience, that's, go to the end result, which we want to drive, we want to have the right employee experience, like we have the right customer experience. But that doesn't come from one function. That would be ludicrous because every single interaction that a person has within an organization is driving their employee experience. So if, if that is from their manager, you can have the best theoretical culture. The lived culture is not that. And, and so therefore, it is a business responsibility. So how, do, I mean, I'm, by the way, I really appreciate you tackling these difficult questions because I think everybody uh, is in search of perspective around these issues. And clearly, you know, your organization, Zurich Insurance Company, has created a role that you're leading around people innovation and transformation. Tell us a little bit about how this role came to be and in, in really the, the, the influence it has on the organization's growth. Because I think a lot of uh, people who are rethinking the role of, uh, of people officer can, can learn a few things from you. I, I do think there's more organizations that have a strategic role within HR that tries to tackle the future of work, trying to get ready. And, and because the issue is the classical organization, HR organization has the business HR business partner and, and the people that, uh, that are doing that. And then you have the CEO, COEs. And the problem is to get innovation, it's no longer in silo. As soon as you think in silos, that doesn't work. So what we wanted to have is, is and what we realized when I drove the previous project, it's, it's really, it's not actually project journeys. You need to be a, to, to break boundaries and, and break down silos, but actually bring the right people around the table and see the connectivity from one decision you make here has an impact, ripple down effect somewhere else. And that's why we, we said we need to take those kind of things out of the day to day to something else. And I'm not sure we actually did a conscious decision to shape that, but actually we realized there's certain change that needs to happen. And, and I, uh, I liked the idea and given my taste for disruption, I, I love the title because I do think uh, it is something that is important. And it sends a signal, as you say, you have a perception of Zurich insurance being very modern because of that kind of willingness to go there. And I think that's important and it's very willing to go to, to really ensure work sustainability. So sustainability beyond just uh, the environment, because sustainability has many different dimensions. And one of them is the sustainability of the people it employs. And there's a responsibility an organization has towards its people, just as much as towards its customers or towards the environment in generally or the society it operates. How do you define work sustainability? It's about creating safety. No, uh, ensuring that people can be successful today and tomorrow and understand how to prepare themselves for it. There's a responsibility. I think we all know about the change in the world and certain skills become redundant. Certain things will be replaced by AI and you can go in and either hide it and say, we're not going to talk about it, but most people have it in their mind, which creates more 
psychological unsafety, or uh, you go in and uh, and say, listen, I can't teach you anything. I ha can help you to go. I mean, I cannot make you drink the water, but I can bring you to the well. And that is really what we're trying to do is saying, listen, let's be honest. Let's treat each other as adults, not HR, the, the leader is not the parent figure and, and the team members are the children because no one wants to be a child. I mean, children might want to be children and, and I might sometimes like to be a child because you're getting, you can get away with more. But generally in an organizational setting, you want to be treated as, as a full individual and with what you bring to the table. And I think what I like is if you then treat them as adults and have open conversations and say, these roles will over time go away, but this is how we can help you. So I help you to upskill. I focus on my internal talent before I focus on external talent. I try to help people have the various careers or various chapters because that's becoming more and more important. And that I think is, is the, the crux of it. And, and when we talk about work sustainability, it's about how do we create a workforce that's fit for future today and tomorrow to serve our customers and, and uh, the, the organization. And I think many companies, so I've had lots of conversations with some companies and we're all trying to tackle that, or many are trying, maybe not all, those that I'm talking to are trying to tackle that. So Annabelle, as we kind of get close to closing, I, um, when I hear you define work uh, sustainability, I'd love to get your reaction to this. Is, is it a fair statement that all of these things that we're trying to bring to the people function are a result of years of suppressing individuality? Yes, I, I would say that there was certainly, if you look at, I like the song nine to five, uh, was it Dolly Parton or something? But there was the idea, you go to a job, you provide a service, which is a machine service. And well, you just do a repetitive task and then you go away and you actually live your life. And that's, that's no longer the case. People look for more from a a job. I mean, not everyone, by the way, but many. And we didn't provide that space. We and and we started talking about a few years, quite a few years ago, when we started talking about DNI, uh, DNI, and and start, starting thinking about how do we make inclusive teams. Uh, certainly, in, in consultancy, that was a topic already e easily twenty years ago. But it's so hard to crack. So I do think we need to find a way of bringing the full human to it. And I think really, when you ask me how I ended up in the people function, it probably comes from, I studied uh, management and economics, but I studied that in London where it was really much more of a sociological background. And what I found always fascinating is how can a bunch of people come together and create something extraordinary and uh, that an individual cannot do, but we need to create that sense that people understand that, that there is a sense of pride around it and that there is a, a sense of belonging in the sense. So here's my final question. We're going to close strong here. Ready? <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm scared now. I, I feel like we've <laughs> no. gone strong all day. You've been wonderful. Do you think that diversity, equity, and inclusion is bringing us together or pushing us further apart? If we really do inclusion, it brings us together. If, uh, and and uh, the problem is always when you talk about rules and numbers and sometimes you need to do that to see change happening but as long as you talk about diversity and inclusion it's not there so as long as i have to talk about hiring uh, women or uh, different uh, gen, uh, different sexuality or different uh, races or whatever you want to talk about it's as long as i have to talk about it and set targets i'm not there yet i haven't achieved it yet. Do, does that mean I'm driving it further apart? I wouldn't necessarily say so, but uh, it shows that we're still not there. Yeah. In, in terms of the biggest focus, and I think most people talked about D and I, I uh, but I think first the D, and I think we should first have to talk about the I, because as long as we don't make people feel part of the, and being there and being allowed to be their full self, so psychological safety, they can't feel included and therefore will not include themselves and therefore will be try to fit into something that doesn't allow them to be really included. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, so if you don't mind, I'm going to say what you just said without saying it, that if all we do is measure representation, 
of diversity, but do not provide a culture of inclusion where people see physical and visible changes to the culture, it actually creates more silos and pushes us further apart. Now, I know you didn't say that, I did, but I think that the reason I bring this up is that this whole conversation in many respects has been around psychological safety. And when you don't have it, it pushes everybody apart. So, um, absolutely. And so, you know, first of all, uh, thank you. Um, but, but I, I have one last question. Um, and I just, when you think about technology and mm -hmm. do you think that, well, I'll have you react to this. Um, I actually believe that technology might be the next form of standardization. In other words, we seem to over index on shiny objects but we under index on the human. What do you think? Yes, I mean, I, I find it, uh, I, I cannot disagree because obviously, uh, as soon as you talk about technology and often cloud systems, which are one solution that uh, is done for the masses, not the individual, because a solution you build is always for the masses, not the individual. It always leads to that. I do think they are trying to find personalization through data and, and what have you. So you can, it can be both ways, but it is just, sorry, it is just an issue that most people get lost in it. I mean, I, I remember when I was young, I left the house and said, uh, mom, I see you at seven. And she was not scared. I was not scared. And if I didn't come home at seven, I had a problem. Now kids at the age of six, seven, eight have their mobile phones and constantly being reviewed, et cetera. So there's this control and, and the system and technology creates controls and creates independence. And I, I'm hooked to this thought. And it's, it's very, it's scary sometimes how much time I spend on this versus anything else. So it becomes, you become a slave to technology to some degree. And that's the phone, that's the computer, that's it, when my computer doesn't work, I don't know how to do my work. Slightly scary. Well, look, Annabelle, you've been wonderful. I really appreciate your time. And uh, do you have any parting comments for uh, those in the, in the world that, that are dealing with people challenges? Uh, any, any wisdom that you'd like to leave with them? Uh, more than you already have. I would just say be, be yourself and be humble. Be, be clear that you have your faults because we all have them and you have your strengths and be aware possibly of both, ideally, because some people tend to over-index on one side or the other. Uh, so find a right balance. Uh, know that you don't have to have all the answers, but uh, if you are there to help the others and, and bring all that positivity, I think you can always have a positive impact on others and, and be a leader. Perfect. Annabelle, thank you so much. And as we always leave the show, when you lead in the age of personalization, you will see things that others don't. You'll do what others won't, and you'll keep pushing when prudence says quit. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Personalization Outbreak. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss a show. If you enjoyed the content, visit ageofpersonalization.com to check out our free streaming video series and learn how to get involved in the movement. I'm Glenn Yopis. I wish you a good day, and remember, without strategy, Change is merely substitution, not evolution.